No matter how 
is why the path of Gyan is not a complete path to God, but if the Gyani adds Bhakti, if the Gyani surrenders to God, then he can reach God. Then that becomes Gyan, Yog, the Yog part meaning surrender to God. The Gyan Yogi can reach God. It means that Bhakti is the magic ingredient that you added to the path of Gyan, it becomes Gyan Yog, then you can reach God. You add it to the path of Karma, it becomes Karma Yog, then you can reach God. But neither Karma nor Gyan on their own is a complete path to God. Karma Yog is, Gyan Yog is, or Bhakti on its own is. So we understood why we want to follow the path to God, that we have these three paths to God, karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, but since jnana yoga requires total renunciation, we'll concentrate on karma yoga and bhakti yoga. So then I explain to you that these two paths are very linked for us people living in the world. Karma yoga, as you just heard me review, means having the mind attached to God while physically doing all your actions in the world. Karma means your good actions, and yoga means the attachment of your mind in God. That's the bhakti part. So karma yoga is a way of practicing bhakti, you can say. Yesterday I also explained a little bit about the karma, because there are four kinds of karma described in the Gita. Karma, you know, good actions, they take you to Swara. Vi karma, bad actions, takes you to Naraka or the lower species, leads to more suffering. Both of these karma and vi karma are bandhan karak, they keep you bound under maya. So both karma and vi karma are performed by those with incomplete knowledge, agyani, those who believe themselves to be the body, in their natural search for happiness, they decide that the world is the source of their happiness. And then they either perform karma or vikarma with worldly attachments and desires, and therefore those actions find them. But it is the attachment behind the action which is binding. It is not the action itself. So the attachment of the mind is the important thing. So the definition of karma is good actions performed with the mind attached in the world. Therefore, you are reborn in the world. And vikarma means bad actions performed with your mind attached in the world. Therefore, you are reborn in the world. And then the other two types of actions are both forms of bhakti, karma yoga or karma sannyas. Karma yoga is what you're doing when you're actively engaged in worldly activities, but keeping the mind attached to God. That is karma yoga. And what you're doing right now is karma sannyas. Right now you've disengaged yourself from worldly activities, and you're only doing bhakti. You're doing bhakti mentally and physically. You're physically in the temple, you're sitting, listening about God, and your mind is in God. So this is called karma sannyas. This is one way of practicing bhakti. And the other way, keeping your mind attached to God while you're active in the world, that is called karma yoga, but it's really just a way of practicing bhakti. So, this brings us to the point of practical application of the philosophy of karma yoga. When Sri Krishna says, Tasmat sarveshu kaleshu mamanu smara yudhyacha, he encapsulates the whole theory of karma yoga. He says, Arjuna, remember me all the time and do your duty. This is karma yoga. Now when it comes to practical application, there are three or four 
misconceptions that prevail in the world, where people make a slight mistake in applying this philosophy, and it diverts them from actually being able to successfully do karmio. So one of the misconceptions, probably the most common misconception is karma yoga means doing good. If you poll people who have heard of karma yoga, know about karma yoga, and you ask them for a definition, what is karma yoga, 99.9% .9 of people will say karma yoga is doing good in the world. And that's the philosophy of Gita. But those of you who have been sitting here for the last two days listening to my speech, you're thinking, no, karma is doing good in the world. Karma yoga is doing good in the world with your mind attached to God. It's a big difference. Just doing good means your mind is attached to the world because the mind is definitely attached somewhere. None of us are completely free. Our mind is either attached to God or it's attached to the world, one or the other. So if it's not attached to the world, if it's not attached to God, it's definitely attached to the world. And those good actions we perform with worldly attachment are binding. And they are called karma, not karma yoga. So what is karma yoga? Again, doing the same good actions with the mind attached to God. How to have the mind attached to God? I explained yesterday. To have the mind attached to God, you have to desire God. And to desire God, you have to have correct knowledge. See, if you're hungry, you're naturally going to want food. It happens automatically. So our hunger is our desire for happiness. We all have that hunger. So naturally we want to get something to satisfy that hunger. That's like wanting food. If you feel hungry, you want food, desire. So we desire naturally because from our very soul we want happiness. We have a hunger for happiness. Now, let's say you have a choice. You have two plates of food in front of you. One plate of food is mixed with some tasteless poison. And the other plate of food is mixed with tasteless amrit nectar that will give you eternal life. Which one will you choose? Obviously, with the correct knowledge, you'll choose the one with Amrit. But let's say the two plates of food, at least to your eyes, don't look the same. Let's say one plate looks very attractive, has a nice taste to it, is very nicely spiced. But mixed in that is poison. And the other one is very bland. Let's say it's just steamed vegetables. No salt even. But there's a limited mix in that. Now someone without the correct knowledge of the value of Amrit, he'll choose the good tasting food and he'll say, there may be poison in it, I'll deal with that later. <laughs> Whatever is the effect of the poison when that hits, then I'll worry about it. For now, let me just enjoy the taste of this food. Who wants to eat steamed vegetables? What I mean is, in the beginning, the world seems very tasty, it's very alluring. But later we realize that we're paying a price, that our ambition to get happiness from this world just multiplies our stress, brings disappointment after disappointment. It ends up leading to unhappiness. And turning towards God seems very bland in the beginning. Because the world is more attractive initially. It's kind of like, you see, let's say there's a doctor standing there saying, these veggies are better for you. Eat these steamed veggies, it's better for your health. You'll be happier in the long run. Don't eat this deep fried food with 
If the 
things out of her father's house get stolen, she won't feel that. In other words, she detached her mind from her father's house and things, and she attached her mind to her in-law's house and things. How? She just understood. That is no longer mine. This is mine. This is where I'm going to get my happiness. So she got attached there. It seems so simple, but that's all there is to it. Understanding this is so important that you can say the whole house of, the whole palace of spiritual progress is built on this understanding. The answer to this one question, where is happiness? However deeply we understand this, that's how much our mind will turn to God. That's how much we will start desiring God. So that's up to us. How deeply do we think about it? How many times do we think about it? So, if that decision has become firm in the mind, that happiness is in God, then that person will desire God, they'll become attached to God, and their mind will stay attached to God even when they're doing good actions in the world, and that person can perform karma yoga. So if that decision has not been made, if someone is still under the illusion that there is happiness in this world, and I will find it, and I'm going to do all the good actions in the world, that's good that you're doing good actions, but that's not karma yoga. Karma yoga is performed by that person who believes happiness is in God. I hope this is clear now, because this is the number one confusion about karma yoga. Karma yoga is not doing good actions. That is just karma. Karma yoga is deciding that happiness is in God, Desiring God only, becoming attached to God, and while maintaining that mental attachment in God, with God as the goal of your life, performing good actions in the world. That is Karma Yoga. The second misconception is to do with uh, some of the verses of the Gita, like this one. Yat karo si. Yet to Siyat, Yet Tapas Yasi Kaunteya, Tat Kurushu Matar Param. Shri Krishna says, Arjuna, offer all of your actions to me. And that is Karma Yoga. Yes, that is a definition of Karma Yoga. That those actions which are offered to Krishna are Karma Yoga. So how is an action offered to Krishna? If you are remembering him at the time of the action, number one, and number two, doing that action to please him, that is karma yoga. But how do most people take this verse? They do something like, before they go to bed, at the end of the day, they'll remember Krishna for a few minutes or a few moments and they'll say, Krishna, whatever actions I did today, I offer it all to you. So it means they didn't remember him at the time of the action. They're remembering him after having performed that whole day's worth of actions and saying, all of that, the last 12 hours, 16 hours, I offer it all to you. But it doesn't work that way. But having 
eaten the food if we try to offer it to him, it's too late. Similarly, it's too late to offer actions once they've already been performed. That person sitting on their bed before sleeping, saying to Krishna, I offer my whole day's actions to you. What are they actually offering? They're offering those few moments where they're sitting on the bed thinking of Krishna. That much has been offered because only for those moments was their mind actually in God. The rest of the day they were just attached in the world, so those are ordinary good or bad actions. They're not karmayo. So you can offer it beforehand or afterwards. You can't say when you wake up in the morning, Krishna, everything I'm going to do today, I offer it to you ahead of time. Then you, could, you might as well just make one statement. Krishna, whatever I'm going to do for the rest of my life, I offer it all to you. Must chuti. <laughs> or before dying, Krishna, whatever I did for my whole life, I offer it all to you. <laughs> if, if only it were that easy. But it's not. We have to live in the moment. Every moment we have to be aware that we belong to Him. Our life is for Him. And this action this moment is for him. Then we're offering our actions to him. One more misconception is based on this verse of the Gita. Karmani vadhikaraste ma bhaleshu kadachan ma karmthahe turbhur ma te sambhustva karmani do not be attached to the fruit of your actions. Do not perform the actions because of what you are going to get out of it, nor be attached to inaction. So some people, when they try to practically apply this, they take a wrong turn. And they think that what this means is, by performing actions with no aim in mind, that's karma yoga. For instance, uh, nowadays there are some popular retreat centers where people go and they think they're doing karma yoga. They advertise it as a karma yoga weekend or a karma yoga retreat. So what do you do? You go there and do aimless actions. Like, let's say there's a lake and you're staying in a lodge nearby. So your activity for part of the day is to go, take a bucket, fill the water, go and dump it somewhere. <laughs> then there's some wood over there, take an axe and chop the wood. Why are you chopping the wood? No reason. You don't need the wood for anything. Why are you carrying the water? It doesn't matter. Nobody is going to use the water. So they call it chop wood carry water. <laughs> it's a chop wood carry water weekend and that's covering you because you're doing an aimless action. Now, why do people do this? They actually do have an aim in mind. Darshan Shastra says, no one can do any action without an aim in mind. They have a prayojan, and with that prayojan in mind, they take action. So, this person's aim, who's doing this chop wood carry water weekend, their aim is very simple. They're getting relaxation by doing that kind of physical activity without any, without any stress, nothing. Just get some physical exercise, keep the mind relaxed. So their goal is still happiness. So they do have a goal in mind. But that's not karma. For one, you can't perform an action without an aim. There's no such thing as aimless actions. If you had no aim, you would be lying dead like a log. You do have an aim. That's to find happiness. And that's why you are always performing actions. So, how do we apply this philosophy practically? Again, someone may think, well, it means that, that you don't mind about the outcome. That's not exactly right either. I mean, let's say you do have an aim in mind. Let's
let's say, uh, you want to design some new software. Maybe your job is that you're a computer programmer. So your aim is to create a certain software which is going to do a certain thing. You have your aim in mind. Okay. Now, someone has that aim in mind, but he's read Gita and he might be thinking, now I can't be attached to the outcome. Meaning, uh, I shouldn't worry about the outcome. How are you going to build a computer program if you're not worried about the outcome? Of course you're concerned about the outcome. If you fail to create this thing, you might lose your job. If you create it and there's too many bugs in it, you might get fired. You want to create something great that works so you can get a raise, so you can keep your job, or just so you can have some accomplishment, some success. You have an aim in mind, definitely, and you are attached to the outcome of that. Wasn't Arjuna, wasn't he concerned about the outcome of the war? Yes, he was. He wasn't fighting carelessly. See, if you don't care how something turns out, you'll do it carelessly. You'll just randomly enter some information into your computer and create a random computer program, software program. Nobody works like that. Arjuna didn't fight the war carelessly. He fought the war with full attention on his desired outcome. Yet it was Pariyo. See, here's where people get confused. How can you be fully focused on getting a desired outcome and yet still call it karma yoga? Because I thought karma yoga meant not worrying about the outcome. No, that's not the meaning of karma yoga. You see, Arjun fought the war with full focus. Complete attention of his conscious mind. Yet, his mind was still attached to Krishna. Because, for one, he was obeying Krishna. He was following Krishna's instructions. And for two, he was not attached personally to the outcome of the war. See the difference? He was focused on a desired outcome to stop these people like Duryodhana, bring them to justice, settle things properly. He had a desired outcome and he was trying to attain that outcome. But he was not personally attached to the outcome. He was not fighting a war because he wanted to enjoy the pleasures of being king. He was not fighting the war because he wanted to be remembered as a great warrior. He wasn't doing it for his own name and fame or his own enjoyment. Why did he do it? Simply because it was the right thing to do. That's it. So he did have a desired outcome, but he wasn't personally attached to what he was going to get from it. Take another example. A surgeon can perform a surgery without personal attachment in the person that they're operating on or in the outcome. A surgeon has a job to do and does that job with full focus. But where is the surgeon's attachment? The surgeon's attachment is in their own family. It's a male surgeon, then his attachment is in his wife, in his children, in his parents. If it's a female surgeon, her attachment is in her husband, her kids, her parents. So is the lack of attachment in the patient going to hurt or help the surgeon? Help. The surgeon knows I need to have a clinical detachment. They even have a term for it, clinical detachment. It means you approach the situation with 
intellectual analysis. You understand the situation, the problem, you understand the solution, and then you implement it to the best of your ability for this desired outcome, but you're not personally attached to what you're going to get from that. Where is your attachment? In your own family. In fact, even if that person dies, it happens. There's no, not a single surgeon in the world that has 100% success all the time. Sometimes you succeed and sometimes you won't. If you had a personal stake in the outcome of that surgery, then when you succeed, you'll feel elated. And if you don't succeed, you'll feel depressed. That's not karma yoga. Karma yoga says try your best, but keep your mind attached to God. See, the surgeon, a normal surgeon, will have his mind attached to his family and physically do his best to perform the surgery. A karma yogi surgeon will have his mind attached to God and do his physical best to perform the surgery. See, there's no difference. Both ways, his mind is not attached to the patient. But the karmi, let's say he's a karmi, he's doing good, he's a good surgeon. His mind will be attached in the world, just not in this patient. His mind is attached elsewhere in the world and he's performing surgery. He's a karmi. The karma yogi's mind is attached to God because he knows that happiness is in God and attaining God is the goal of his life. But he can still perform his surgery. A judge is not attached to the defendant or the plaintiff. A teacher is not attached to his or her pupils or, or students. Their mind is attached to their people, in their kids, their family. The nurse in a maternity ward is not attached to the children being born in that ward. Many of the children may die. A nurse working in a maternity ward must see dozens of children die every year. It happens. That nurse doesn't get depressed because of that. Why? Because they're not attached to those kids. They're attached to their kids at home. If they were attached to every kid that they treated in the hospital, they couldn't function. They'd be so depressed all the time because they're seeing so many sick people all the time. They're not, they're not depressed because they're not attached. So in fact, we can do more good when we're not attached. This is why Gita, all of our scriptures, recommend attachment in God and work in the world. Good work, good actions, to the best of our ability, but attachment in God. Why? Come back to the same philosophy. Because happiness is in God, not in the world. So why would you get attached in the world? What sense does that make? That's like churning water hoping to get butter. There's no butter in the water. There's butter in the milk. Churn milk. So there's happiness in God, not in the world. So why would you get attached in the world? Only out of ignorance. The basic ignorance that I am the body, so happiness must be in the world. And the basic understanding, I am the soul, so happiness must be in God. So it's a very fine line between karma and karma yoga from one perspective, because the physical actions seem very similar. But internally, there's a world of difference. And the outcome is also the world's apart. Because through karma yoga, you attain God and you get perfect happiness forever. And through just karma, you remain bound in this world. So, Again, talking about these misconceptions of karma yoga. Karma yoga does not mean doing actions without caring about the outcome. We do care about the outcome, but we're just not personally attached. We're not performing. Here's the best way to think about it. Karma yoga means 
means you're not performing this action because you think by succeeding you're going to get happiness out of that. That's not karma. If you think that by doing this I'm going to get happiness, you're not doing karma. Because happiness is in God. So, karma yoga means just doing the best with the understanding that your real goal is to attain God, but you do this because you also have to insist in the world. So it's a very, uh, very good way to live in the world. You can be calm and balanced. You can react to situations appropriately instead of emotionally reacting. See, parents say, how can I take care of my kids without attachment? Do you know what attachment is? Attachment is inherently selfish. If you're attached to your child, it means you expect to get happiness out of them. That's the basis of attachment. Where we believe we'll get happiness, that's where we get attached. So it means you're selfishly desiring that your kid should behave in a certain way, turn out in a certain way. Why? So it will make you happy, proud. That's selfish. So being attached is not helping your kids. Attach your mind to God and then do your duty towards your kids. Duty means educate them, guide them, give them affection. Give them what they need. Not what you want. And that's only possible when you are attached to God instead of to your kids. This is our own homemade philosophy when we think that, oh, we, I have to be attached here. That, that's not said in any scripture or by any saint. We made that up ourselves to justify our own attachment. It's natural because our mind likes being attached. It's attached because of its own decision that there's happiness here. So of course it wants to stay attached. It thinks it's going to lose something by releasing that attachment. But it's not losing anything, it's gaining. <laughs> Our attachment is what binds us in this world. Release the attachment and you're free. You're free to do your duty responsibly and to the best of your ability without the interference of those attachments. And you're free to attach your mind to God to attain eternal happiness. So you're not losing by releasing attachments, you're gaining. Yet, the best approach is still not to try to remove attachments from the mind. The best approach is to reason with the mind and just say, you should desire happiness from God. That's where happiness just reason with the mind and let it start to experience happiness from God. Then it will naturally start to divert from the world towards God. It happens naturally, not forcefully. So these are the inner secrets of Karma Yoga. This is how we apply it in our life. It's based on the correct knowledge on remembering that knowledge that happiness is in God and we are divine souls who belong to God. And if we apply this knowledge in this way, we get tremendous benefit. The ultimate benefit, of course, is God realization. But even in our day-to-day -day life, we get the benefit of becoming better at everything we do, because the more you reduce the worldly attachments, the better you can perform your duties, do your job, take care of your family. That becomes easier, you become better at it. Right now you have to take my word for it, but I'm telling you that's my own experience, that the more my worldly attachments reduce by following the path of bhakti, even before I took sannyas, I also lived in the world and practiced this philosophy before becoming a sannyasi, and I experienced that I was better, my interaction with people became easier. My life became easier. Why? Because my emotions became more calm and under control the more my attachment was there. 
So you can reap a lot of benefits by implementing this philosophy in your life. And the experience grows. So the more you attach your mind to God, the more you experience. Experience what? Experience God. <laughs> That's what we want to experience because God is happiness. And God is omnipresent. And the only way to experience God, even though He's omnipresent, you can't experience Him unless you attach your mind to Him. Or another way of saying that is you surrender to Him. So the process of becoming surrendered is what I've been explaining to you. You gradually divert your mind
Smarter means thinking of God as form or thinking of his lilas. That's the easiest way to say it. Means if you were a devotee of Radha Krishna, then if you're picturing their form and in your mind, we also call that Rup Dhyan, then you're doing smarter. If you're thinking of their lilas, you're doing smarter. Smarter on its own is enough to purify your heart because God, His form, His lilas, they're one and they're divine. So if you're attaching your mind to Him through thinking of His form and thinking of His lilas, then your mind is being purified. But remember, it's not just, it's not just a mental activity that you're doing. You have a reason why you're meditating form or as he does. The reason is that you desire him. You want to attain him. So it means that when you visualize his form, you should also try to long for him. Long to meet him. Long for him to come to you. Shed tears. Our longing should be sincere enough that we should shed tears to meet him. You should feel related to him. If you're separated from someone that you love or that you're related to, you feel a longing, and that longing, if it's intense enough, can bring tears. So we should feel such a relationship and such a longing for Krishna as well. So with that feeling, if you visualize him or his lilas, that will be That in and of itself is enough, however, most people won't be able to maintain that kind of meditation for long without some help. So the help is why we have other two kinds of bhakti that we add in. Shravan is what you're doing right now. You, your mind has been engaged in thinking of God non-stop for the last hour that I've been speaking, and then I'm almost done. You, you, all of your minds have been focused on God for the last hour. You've been doing smarter. Why? Because the key, the, the shravan, you're listening about God, and that is engaging your mind in thinking of God. So the shravan is helping you do smarter. But if you're just listening, your ears are open, but your mind is somewhere else, you're doing shravan, but you're not doing smarter. That's a new value. So the smarter is the main thing. Shravan is a help. When we did Kirtan in the beginning, if you were just singing from your mouth while your mind was elsewhere, that's not happy. The Kirtan is also supposed to help us engage our mind in thinking of God, His form, His vidas. So the Kirtan or the Shravan are helpers. Very simple way to help you engage your mind in thinking of God. So we combine Shravan and Kirtan with Smarana, and that is the formula for practicing Bhakti. And you do this for some time every day, according to your own schedule. That speeds up the process of developing love and attachment for God in your heart. And it should go on increasing the more you practice. Then you are more able to remember God throughout the day. Someone might wonder, how is it possible when I'm focused on other activities to keep thinking of God? It only happens when our mind becomes deeply attached to God. So none of us right now is a true karma yogi. Because as soon as we focus on some job we're doing, we forget God. Because we're not deeply enough attached to Deep attachment is like, let's say you're a newlywed. You just got back from your honeymoon. Now newlyweds are generally very much attached to each other and they keep thinking about each other all the time. So the husband and wife then go off to work, but even while they're at work, they keep remembering each other. How is that even possible? If their conscious mind is absorbed in doing some task, how are they able to maintain that remembrance? Because that 
that other person is so deep in their heart. You can say that that attachment is in their, it's gone into their subconscious mind. So those attachments remain deep in your heart. So that's how, let's say, you're meeting someone after a long time. You haven't seen your mother in three years and she's coming from India tonight. But you have a bunch of errands to run all day. Maybe you even have to go to work. Again, maybe you're a computer programmer, you're doing computer programming. It takes full mental focus to do that computer programming. Yet, you're so excited to pick your mother up at New York Airport tonight, that even while you're doing your computer programming, some part of your heart is remembering your mother. How is that possible? It's attachment. That's how it works. Your conscious mind is here, but your deep attachment is somewhere else. That feeling of affinity for that person remains deep in the heart, even when the conscious mind is engaged in doing something else. So it's not really like your mind is in two different places, because your conscious mind can only think of one thing at a time. But even while your conscious mind is doing one thing, that deep affinity remains in your heart. So, how do we develop that affinity? Keep thinking, he's mine. I'm related to him. He's my friend, my mother, my father. He is happiness. By getting him, I'll get happiness. Keep thinking that. Do sadhana. The sadhana I just explained, where you sit and you listen to Girtan. You do Kirtan, you do Shravana, and you use that to help you remember Him deeply, longing for Him. That's smart. Through this, you develop that attachment in your heart more and more for God. That allows you to remember Him throughout the day so that you're able to practice Karma Yoga. So then your attachment is with God and you're physically functioning in the world. That's the definition of Karma Yoga. Along with this, due to your attachment to God, you're experiencing more and more happiness and contentment because He is happiness. So as much as you're attached to Him, that much happiness you're experiencing. And your worldly attachments are reducing, so life in the world is becoming better and easier as well. But to do this, we have to implement this philosophy. You have to keep reviewing it in your mind, Try to practice it. Try to do some devotion every day where you sit and do smarana along with Kirtan and Shravana. This is the path. This is the path outlined in our scriptures. This is the path taught by my Guruji, Jagat Guru Shri Bhavanti Maharaj, which is a simple and universal path. It's not specific to any type of person or even to uh, any sect. It's a, it's, a, it's a principle, a philosophy which can be adopted into one's life and practiced and which you can benefit from. So, I'm going to end my lecture here today. There is more to understand, but uh, to understand more I can give you some options which you yourself can pursue. As I mentioned previously, the speeches of Jagat Bhushi Babaji Maharaj are on television every day, on TV Asia in the mornings, seven days a week, and on Austin.